The literal direct correlation of latitude is Murfreesboro to central Tokyo. The flora and the fauna are so similar. Japanese maples all in my mom's yard. Over time, there has been this really unique relationship established between Middle Tennessee and Japan, which has not affected the way that I cook, but it's helped me to connect to a culture that I am not from. And so this connection has helped me to create my own connection. You can't do something this hard if you don't love it and you can't love it unless you have a connection to it in a way that is not just superfluous. Sure. So that connection between Middle Tennessee, being here at this time in my life, making ramen for people here, that brought it all together. Tennessee and Tokyo, not the first two places you put together on a map, but they have more in common than you might think. For Chef Sarah Gavigan, that relationship runs very deep. Her love of both Japanese and Tennessee cultures and their foods are at the center of her desire to bring a fresh spin on ramen to Nashville. I see a lot of similarities between Japanese and Southern vegetables. They're prepared very differently, but they're very, very similar. A lot of that having to do with the latitude being the same, I think, the same things grow there that grow here. The way that Southerners that I grew up with use salt is very similar to the way that Japanese use salt. And so when I was in kind of in training, in my training years of learning ramen and learning Japanese food, and I was, I have a, what they would call a sensei who taught me everything about ramen, but I also have a handful of other really talented Japanese chefs that have helped me along the way and taught me. The thing that they all said was that my relationship to salt was the same as theirs. The way that I salted food, the way that I understood that it was to season and not to salt, and that there are different layers of how to do that. And if you think about like, you know, great cornbread isn't salty because of the salt. It's salty because of the fat that came from the country ham. So Japanese food kind of works in a similar way. It's just about building the flavors rather than just needing that flavor to sit on top of something. Tastes are everything when creating unforgettable dishes. For Sarah, it's all about umami, a unique category. Umami is the fifth flavor, not bitter, salty, sweet, or sour, but it has its own complex profile, often described as meaty and savory. Japanese in origin, the word means the essence of taste, and it's one that drives the flavors found at otaku. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the layers of how to build a bowl of ramen. Okay. But this is really where it all starts, right here. So this is what we call the tare, T-A-R-E. And it is the concentrated version of flavor here. And this is really what kind of makes or breaks any ramen shop's flavor system is their tare. So here we have what we call the shio, which in Japanese means salt. salt. So it's really just like a complex version of salt. Here we have the shoyu, which is another complex version of salt. This is a black garlic miso tare, and then this is our regular miso tare. It's really interesting to me because like, oftentimes here in Tennessee, we talk about the time and effort that goes into making great yes. barbecues. The tare becomes your dry rub, where you're yeah. adding your own essence and flavors. And like a good pit master, when you said this is salt and this is soy, yeah. I also understand there's other components that are going into that that make yeah. it uniquely yours. Well, like with the shio, we're talking about sake, sugar, a little bit of MSG. Um, and with the shoyu, we're talking about things like mushroom powder and other, again, like if you think of umami as a puzzle and you're just bringing more umami to the table every time you add different amino acids. And so if you were to kind of stack a bowl, mm -hmm. we're going tare, we've got broth, yep. and then noodle, and, and then, then toppings. toppings. Okay. So is this the most popular dish that you're serving? The tenkatsu is literally the number one. Okay. It's literally numbered the number one, and it's always and the number one. And what's the translation tenkatsu? So tenkatsu means pork bone. And usually in Japan, when you say tenkatsu, it's almost always referring to ramen. Okay. 
So with the tonkatsu, we're going to use a shio tare. And this is very concentrated salty, right? So because yeah, you can imagine one ounce of the salt up against 12 ounces of the broth. Okay. Then we're going to add a little bit of garlic oil. Garlic plays a very big role in ramen. In umami or just ramen in general? In ramen in general, but in umami specifically, it just adds to the party. And then I'm going to add a little bit of white pepper. It plays a big role in ramen, very um, because mostly for you don't want to see the specks, right? right? It's for a visual, but also because it's got that kind of musty flavor to it. And that's a really big part of what we do. And what we're going to do next is move over to our noodles. So there's no egg in this ramen, in this noodle. This noodle is made of water, flour, and what the Japanese call kansui, which okay. is really like a baking soda. It's a sodium bicarbonate. So kind of eat it raw okay. first. And you get the sense of like, it's this guy's stretchy. It's elastic. It's really stretchy. I mean, it tastes good raw. Yeah. And so the noodle is something that Probably if you have a many, many bowls of ramen, is that the first taste, kind of the al dente, the Sicilian style? Yeah. It's got to be perfect every yeah. time. Yeah. So. 30 in, seconds. In the tank we go. And we will hit 30 seconds. All right, we're going to turn okay. this bowl and top her off. So a little bit of a Tennessee influence here with, with pulled pork as kind of the protein to serve on top of the tonkatsu. Yeah, so again, like every ramen shop, every ramen chef tries to find that one thing that makes them a little bit different, that makes their ramen stand out from others. So when we were building this bowl for the first time, I really wanted to do the pork confit because it reminded me of barbecue and I wanted to kind of give people that ability to see that, you know, something that was familiar to them. What you want to do is get just enough noodles so that when you pull it all the way out, okay. that you can have that as one bite. It's like a, a party in your mouth kind of vibe, but there's just a really consistent flavor of comfort that you taste throughout the dish. I mean, again, I, 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 I can't say it enough. Umami is responsible for your feelings right now. Blending her experiences of cooking with Japanese flavors and locally sourced ingredients, Sarah brings a southern twist to our party by preparing okonomiyaki for our guests. So I was thinking about the first time we met, mm. crowded room of people, yeah. and the passion of which you described a chicken that was roasting in the oven <laughs> fell only second to the taste of said chicken. Yeah. And I knew right then and there we were gonna be fast friends. Yeah, I am the kind of person that stands over a roast chicken and eats it with my hands. <laughs> I am. So born and raised Columbia, Tennessee, but the journey has taken you beyond Tennessee Very and right nice. back. Walk yeah. Me through. I never thought that I would end up moving back to Tennessee. I mean, I think like a lot of young people and they were born here in the 70s. We're like, okay, it's time, I gotta get out. Gotta get out into the world. And when I got out into the world, I discovered global food culture and it changed me forever. And that really in particular in Los Angeles, I fell into the Japanese neighborhoods and I had had no exposure to Japanese food. So my exposure was very small, but once I started to understand the lexicon of Japanese food, there was like no going back for me. Cooking became like a sport to me. Like, and it's, I think you understand that. It becomes an obsession. It becomes something that is, Nonverbal communication that you get to do. You don't have to talk to people. You get to think through a dish, what you want. But the greatest thing about learning how to cook in a city like Los Angeles is you can get anything. You can get any ingredient. You can, any dish from any part of the world that you want to make, you can probably find the ingredients to do that. So there's no way that I would have understood any of these ingredients had I not had the grocery store that had them right down the street from me. The Japanese grocery store was really kind of where it all started and being able to just buy and learn. And I met a young Japanese man who was traveling on his bike um, and we met him at a campsite and he ended up coming and staying with us in, in our back house. And he really taught me the basics. Like I had never, I'd done it all on my own. And then he was the one that kind of put the ABCs of umami and flavor together for me and helped me to understand it. This is one of my favorite kind of like 
late night foods. It's called okonomiyaki. Okonomiyaki. And it means as you like it, which is basically a cabbage pancake. Okay. And this is one of this is one of the greatest examples of umami. I love it because it's basically really really simple. So I'm gonna just chop up this cabbage right now. What's your definition of umami? Right. So. The definition of umami, what I thought it meant when I started this journey, was that it was like a magic trick. Only great chefs could conjure umami, which is basically a breakdown of the seven amino acids that are in food and how when you combine them, it creates umami. So believe it or not, cabbage has three amino acids in it. Who knew, right? So chicken, one amino acid. Pork, one amino acid. Beef, one. Bring them together, wow. But on their own, not a lot. That's where this guy comes in. So what is this? this is called Namaimo. The Japanese use this mountain yam in a lot of different ways, but specifically it really plays a role in this dish. Now, when I take this down, I take the outside off, I throw it into a blender, and it's just a puree. It has absolutely no taste whatsoever. But when I add it to that, Umami. So this is just the same thing. I've taken this and a little bit of onion and okay. then added some salt to it and let it wilt and left the liquid in there because I'm going to use that liquid to create my batter. Okay. Then I take this pureed with a little bit of egg and just a little bit of AP flour and there we go. You're going to make me a couple pancakes. Okay. So if I put this together. Yes. Are we patting these? Or are we? Yeah. I think okay. just kind of like a little small hey, hey, patter we'll down. I decided that I wanted to start working at a farm, you know, while my daughter was in school. And so I headed out to this farm during the day. And the chef who was running this farm is a really great chef here in Tennessee named Tyler Brown, who's now yep. down at South Hall. And I said, do you have any shiso, by the way? Do you grow shiso here? Which is what this is. And I said, well, it's this razor edged kind of, you know, it's called perilla. Mm -hmm. And he goes, oh, perilla, that grows wild. It's all up against the fence. And I was like, you're kidding me. I think that this is like if mint and basil had a baby. Mm. It's a little medicinal. You might often see this in like a sushi restaurant. So, you know, you'll sometimes see a more green version, smaller version of this, kind of like laying on your sashimi. It's like under your sashimi right there. So all of these things are very, very standard ingredients that go on a lot of different dishes in Japan. Is this like a traditional pancake? They get better as you keep making them? Oh, yeah. Cool. So this, like I said before, this is the, you know, straight out of the ground shiso. And there's a guy that grows it here in Nashville for the chefs called Greener Roots. And then I brought this because I thought it would be fun to add this. So this I brought back from Japan. Okay. And you can see here the shiso leaf and then the kelp leaf. And so is this the moment where you can kind of make it your own? I That's mean, is right. it typically going to be this? as a standard makeup in terms of the batter. Yep. What are we adding here? Okay, so this is bulldog sauce. Bulldog sauce. So bulldog sauce is like mm -hmm. if Worcestershire and ketchup had a party, came together. And this is something that I can commonly find in most yeah. Asian markets? Yeah, Asian markets, for sure. This is Kewpie mayo. So it kind of adds this little bit of an extra tang. And so then after a little bit of bulldog and a little bit of the um, the mayo, I'm going to add what's called Ao nori. Kind of okay. looks like dried parsley, right? It does. It looks exactly right. It's also going to play a very big role in the umami game here. Every single thing that I'm adding is another layer of umami. And I, I love that because it kind of is one of those things that people don't expect it. This is pickled ginger. So you can kind of spread that around as you like. It's beautiful, too. I mean, this is just a dish that yeah, the colors kind are of great. speaks to you. And then a little bit of the shiso. The more that the more time I spend in Japan, the more time I spend with the ingredients, the more times that I learn, I then come back and get to combine the products from Tennessee with the products from Japan. Chasing the umami. Always chasing. Always it. chasing. So here we go. I Unexpected can... to find this here. Yeah. Uh, but knowing you, <laughs> you're gonna bring out the best of everything. Oh, it's so good. Mm. Oh. Party in your mouth. So much going on. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it. It's literally like every part of my palate is singing right now. Yep. I mean, it's hitting on every single note. I mean, the everyday food of Japan is so beautifully simple. That's a big part of what you've been able to 
you know, just make this approachable. Um, I love that we're cooking it in Tennessee cast iron, mm -hmm. using ingredients that you're finding, central Japan to Tennessee, and then ultimately making it your own. And this is just simply delicious. From barbecue to fresh picked vegetables on the farm, our summer party already has a delicious menu. But it's not every day you get a traditional Japanese dish served in the backyard of a Tennessee cocktail party. The growing relationship our two food cultures share might just change that. Yeah, so you grew up here, but yep. uh, the world took you other places. Yeah. And I had, now you're back. I had to go farther afoot to learn more about food. I lived in Los Angeles for 20 years and just kind of fell in love with global food culture. Like, you can go anywhere in 20 minutes and be in a different country, you know? And I fell in love with Japanese food there. But not until I came back here did I realize how many similarities there are between Middle Tennessee and Central Japan. In the ramen shop, we have a a live screen of central Tokyo, so you can kind of see it as you're like in the bathroom. When it's raining here, it's raining there. That's crazy. It's crazy. Because of the latitude. Yeah. Of... Oh, wow. Nice. Nice. Right on time here. Wow. Mm -hmm. What specifically did you make for tonight? So I made what's called okonomiyaki. It means as you like it. So it's basically a pancake made with cabbage, shredded cabbage. So underneath it, we have the shiso leaf, which is actually one of the fun pieces of the heritage and the story of the connection between Middle Tennessee and Japan that I learned. And you'll see it growing wild all over Middle Tennessee. The and leaf. I, yes. This is one of the only places that it grows wild in the United States. And this is the main aromatic in Japanese food. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know what? Oh my my, no. Right. Here, wait. No, seriously, I got to try this see if it's as good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> make sure this isn't poison. Make sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. make, make sure. This wow, is, is that good. And you can choose to live wherever you want, but what is it about Tennessee specifically that, that calls you to raise a family here? Um, yeah, the people. Like, uh, I moved back to New York. The last team I played with was the Giants. We were living there, Edgewater, New Jersey. It was great, right across from New York City. But uh, my kids were getting older, um, and the people, you know, you got the land, look at this, mm -hmm. you know, there's uh, opportunity. And to be honest, um, you know, I spent more than half of my adult life here. I, you know, had my house, my friends, and just to raise a family, you know, it was just no brainer, really. You know, most of our, a lot of our former players, a lot, yeah. end up staying here. Yeah. And I, I find that, and I've coached, as I said, in several different spots, but a lot of guys migrate back here for a lot of those reasons. You know, growing up in a small town in Columbia, it was always about community. And like, for me, I was always like, when can I get out of here? Got to get out of here. You know, and the second that I could, I was gone. Never thought that I would come back ever in a million years. And coming back as like an adult married with a child, like so many emotions that go with that. Sure. That was part of what made me want to start this company was that I was wrestling with all of that. But in, in my older age, I've come to learn that I think really Tennessee is so much about community in a way mm. that other places have never been. I've lived a lot of places. And I think one of the reasons why Nashville has grown the way that it has is because Tennessee is rooted in that. Absolutely. And the community has just blossomed so big, and we've welcomed so many people from all over the world that have moved to Nashville. Yeah. As I say, I've got a lot of people that come to a lot of games here all the years that I've, I've been 16 years, you know, with, with the Titans. And they absolutely have that feeling when they come in here. They say, wow, Coach Mack, Nashville has really got a special feel to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Thank you so Cheers. much. This is. I'm taking the rest of this home. I'm going to have to get some too. <laughs> We say that our mission is to serve happiness one bowl at a time, and our purpose is to bring ramen to the ramenless. I, I think it sounded pretty crazy to open a ramen shop in Nashville, Tennessee in 2015. Right, look at you, you're covered. I, mean, I love it. I think I'm maybe not a fit for the line, mm -hmm. but I certainly feel like... Um, I feel like he wants to keep eating this bowl of ramen. So good. <laughs> Ramen is important to me because it was a place and time where I was in transition in my life as a human being, as a mother, as a wife, as a friend, as a daughter. 
I get emotional about it. Like, I can remember having my first bowl of ramen and this feeling of walking in and being so angry, so upset about something that had gone on at work. And I was just overwhelmed with like how at ease I felt after eating something. And that I had never put those two things together before. It was truly overwhelming. And then I looked around and I was eating in a food court and everyone around me was eating the same thing and everyone was on their own journey. It was everyone eating on their own. And again, growing up in the South, you don't eat alone. You never eat alone. So this was completely foreign to me. So there's something about the singular collective experience that transcended that moment for me and I needed it after that. I didn't want to be alone but I wanted to eat my bowl of ramen to myself in a room full of people that were doing the same thing. And that was such a powerful moment for me so that that is what keeps me going is knowing like what we do here, it's hard. It is hard to run a restaurant. But when you see other people come to that same conclusion over a bowl of ramen and it becomes a place that they can come and sit for 15 minutes and have that 15 minutes to themselves and walk away feeling full and better like that is my purpose that is what i do and i love it mm -hmm.